she was a very confused person later part of his life she was absolutely superstitious on a lot of things but all the same she insisted on secularism secularism and scientific attitude are two different things free thinking and scientific attitude are two different things she was insisting on secularism but she was not insisting on scientific attitude to many things she was superstitious in many things annie besant publicly denounced gandhi's position challenged it but gandhi was very powerful gandhi's will prevailed and one school of thought says that i mean it was annie besant who suggested this name mahatma gandhi the great man great soul whatever it is despite her spirituality despite her new found theosophy despite her belief in occult the free thinker in her worked very well she perhaps ended up as a person whom she was actually destined to become some of she got confused that confusion has damaged her potential she was a leading person who promoted the idea of separation of state and religion she was a really really supporting hand for two major people charles bradlaw as well as bernard shaw but then she falls into a trap of uh, occultism without blind praising understanding the shades and light of a person's life i would say that there is more light that we see than the dark shades that she left behind hello everyone and welcome to the weekend meeting with sanal edmarku i am shubhi sinha heading the youth wing of rationalist international we have been conducting these zoom conferences successfully for quite a few years and we are happy to welcome you again to this meeting please note that in this session our zoom and clubhouse will go simultaneously so once we are done with the uh, presentation uh, we would move on to the question answer round so now moving on to the topic for the meeting uh, which is annie besant so well known name in india and was active in independence movement as a freedom fighter uh, if we talk more about her uh, she was a british socialist theosophist women's right activist writer orator educationist and a philanthropist uh, regarded as a champion of human freedom she was an ardent supporter of both irish and indian self rule uh, Annie Besant was the president of International Congress and was also the part of Indian struggle. Uh, as we know, she was a shishya of Gandhi. We have heard so much about her, but there is so much more to it. Uh, to help us know more about it, we have Sir, Mr. Uh, Edmarku with us to tell us further. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, Shubhi. Now, I would like to tell the brief about Annie Besant. Maybe most of you would know about it. Annie Besant was mainly known as a great freedom struggle leader of India. She was the president of Indian National Congress. She was a British citizen. She spent a major part of her life in Britain, in London, and then she moved to India and became an active part in India's freedom struggle. Let's the Indian National Congress was a close associate of Gandhi ji. I mean, who was the leader of the Indian freedom struggle? very close associate of rabindranath tagore and she died in 1933 before india got independence but there are dramatic events in the life of this lady i mean more dramatic than any movie can really speak about first of all i would give a brief of what annie besant was then i go into the detail of it though annie besant is known as the leader of the theosophical society which is half blended spirituality and half blended rationalism one could say she was also one of the founders of the banaras hindu university and closely associated with gandhi as well as quarrel with gandhi on principles and became an icon of india's freedom struggle in uk she was for india's home rule india's independence and her movement got a lot of support from britain and later the public support for india grew and grew in in, in britain all because of annie besant's initial activities but not from annie besant originally that was from another person who was the first mentor in annie besant's life charles bradlaw that's the story i would like to start with well first of all annie besant was born in 1847 in uh, in greater london in kamfam and she died as i told you uh, on 19 
33 20th of September at the age of 85. So how was her beginning? That's very interesting. She was, I mean, as usual, uh, a normal English woman, but she married. Later, she, I mean, of course, we all know that she was a very famous rationalist and free thinker in Britain, but her career started as a very different person. She was interested in religion. She was fascinated with religion, the evangelical Anglican church. That was what she was interested in. But then her interest slowly started changing towards something different. That is mainly, you know, about the famous uh, London March Girl Strike of uh, 1888. And she was a leading speaker there that was organized by the Fabian Society and the Marxist Social Democratic Federation, STF. It's something, something like what we can uh, speak about the, the early form of the social democratic parties. That was before, long, long before the Russian Revolution, long, long before anybody could think about a political uh, success in the name of uh, socialism. Or, or Marxism. She was interested in a crude form of earlier Marxism and in Fabian socialism. And uh, well, then uh, 1890, 19th century, and she met a person, Blavatsky, Madame Blavatsky, who was also closely associated with uh, Swami Vivekananda. That changed her life to a totally different direction, which we'll speak later. But let's come to the first part of her life. That's the most fascinating part, I think. She became uh, a part of the Harrow School and got an idea about the Roman Catholic taste of things. And she was not very, very much interested in it, but she was interested in the Evangelical Anglican Church. And she married at the age of 26, a young priest. You know, the Anglican Church, the priest can marry, unlike the Catholic Church. And he was Frank Besant. That's how she got the name Annie Besant. And she married this uh, Frank Besant who died in 1917, but much before her major I mean, political activities. She was a practicing vicar and a, a clergyman in, in, in Manchester. And she was closely, again, associated with the Manchester Martyrs and Irish Republican group and all these kind of groups at that time. But eventually, she gets interested in the, the trade union activities of the Tories at one time. Then an interesting part, she refused to attend a communion. In 1877, she returned from the communion efforts and then she returns to London and then she separates with this guy, Mr. Besant, whom she married. So 1873, she became an independent person and left the church. Totally. She did not want to take a communion and she decided to leave the church and she became an independent person. So that's the beginning of a new Annie Besant, thinking about faith in a very critical way. And she joins the Oxford movement. That's a very serious intellectual movement in Britain, asking for a lot of changes and the spirit of enlightenment, enlightenment to take forward, but within the frame of Church of England. It's a kind of a church reform movement within the Church of England. She was still a non-believer, but remained in the church and tried to modernize the church. No, it doesn't work. Then she moved to the scientific attitude. We see a dramatic change in her life when she meets a person, Charles Bratla. Charles Bratla was much elder to him, her, but was a very mature politician who did not contest any elections, but have been having a lot of ideas and fascinating a lot of people all around Britain. And she, as a young supporter of Charles Bradlow, and Charles Bradlow almost became a mentor for her. And uh, she asks, in, in fact, initiates to, initiates, I mean, or, or suggests Charles Bradlow to start a, a movement along with her, which is later known as the National Secular Society. But before that, she was a leading member of the South Place Ethical Society. If you know, you know, the British uh, rationalist movement's history, the oldest rationalist organization that we know in Britain is named as the, it's, it's called the South Place Ethical Society. And the South Place Ethical Society is uh, very famous. The, the convoy hall is owned by them. And a lot of concerts and all these kind of things are performed there. But this was originally started for the rationalist public speeches. And Annie Besant was one of those persons who took initiative to establish at Loins Road 
this famous building. So after the South Place Ethical Society activation, then she slowly moves more and more close to Charles Bratlow. You know what's the background of Charles Bratlow? Charles Bratlow. He was uh, he was accused in a case. It's a very famous case uh, about. I mean, in, in connection with social, his social reform activities and a famous, or for many people, an infamous pamphlet, and they both were accused in the case. That has given a lot of publicity to uh, Charles Bratla as well as for Annie Besant. Eventually, Charles Bratla decides to contest the election to the British Parliament. And uh, imagine a social reformer who did not believe in any God, who denounced the churches, and who denounced the British, I mean, religious structures, decides to contest the election. Would he win the election? But he was so popular, he was so convincing a speaker, and he was elected. And uh, I mean, once he was elected, he had a very serious problem. You know, his colleagues at the time of Charles Bradlaugh were, one was uh, uh, George Jacob Holyoke, Harriet Lowe. These were the main people who were close with him in the Leicester Secular Society and the new secular hall that they made. And uh, Holyoke is an important person because he was one of the founders of the cooperative movement in Britain, but also coined the word, the very famous word that we all know, secularism, was coined by Holyoke, G.J. Holyoke. Before that, the idea of secularism was already existing. In American Constitution and the First Amendment, it very clearly says that there shall be a wall of separation between state and religion. Founding fathers of America have been very clearly insisting about the idea of secularism, but they didn't use the word secularism. Wall of separation between state and religion was what they have been insisting. But Holyoke made the word secularism to insist upon a non religious stance for the government. He said, a state shall be secular. And he insisted on two points on that. Number one, the state and religion should have a wall of separation as it is set in the First Amendment of the American Constitution, as well as there shall not be any connection between the education system and uh, religion. So these were the two major points that they set. Eventually, there is a new point also. Secularism adds one more thing. There shall not be any connection between the ethical system and the moral values and religion. It shall be inherent from secular sources. That will come later. But here, when they insisted on these two points, it got a lot of support and a lot of hatred. The then British society, which was very conservative, even now part of Britain is very, very conservative, you know, and they got denounced by a lot of people, but they, they fascinated a lot of other people. And he contested the election. That was first, he was elected to the parliament in 1881. So practically, his uh, secular activities, his uh, rationalism, his denouncement of the church, insistence on, of, on the separation of state and religion did not affect his political future. That was the first lesson we get in Europe. I mean, that somebody can be clearly rational, atheistic, non-religious and still one can win an election and can be very successful in election. We see a similar pattern in United States of America. Uh, you know about Robert Greene Ingersoll, the great speaker who died by the beginning of the 20th century, was a great orator of his times. Perhaps the greatest orator of all times, one can say, if you know what he has written, the kind of language that he used in his speeches, he did not write anything. He just gave and gave and gave lectures, and he became one of the most popular speakers of his times. Those are not times uh, where we have entertainment. There was no cinema properly, I and mean, there was no other major activities. There was no internet. There was no television. There was not even proper radio. There was no transistor. But uh, Ingersoll's speeches started attracting people. Initially, 20, 30, 50 people, then hundreds. 500, thousands of people started attending his speeches. And he denounced the church. He denounced the whole traditional faith. And he asked for a new value system. And he asked for a, an ethical society based on humane values. And imagine, he was considered to be a candidate for America's president. The Republican Party at those times, uh, he was a Republican. He was a colonel in the war. And he was one of the major, he, he stood with the, the, when the civil war was there, he stood with the nation and stood against slavery. And he was a great national hero. And he lost the, the presidential nomination in the last round, which means, you know, I mean, the, the whole, uh, the process of getting nomination to the 
the presidency for the Republican Party, he reached the, the, the final stage. And the last stage, he has withdrawn for some other candidate with a condition that next election he would be approved by the whole party unanimously. But he didn't live till the next election. He passed away. Otherwise, I, I would always think that, I mean, if Ingersoll lived some more years, he would have been the president of United States of America. That kind of popularity he could get in United States with his atheism, with his pronounced critics of the critic of religion and with his demand for a secular way of life. Inspired by uh, Ingersoll's ideas, a lot of people later came into the political scene all around the world who were not uh, I mean, negatively influenced by their political position because of their rationalism. So one amongst them, as we know, is uh, uh, Charles Bradlaugh. He contested the election and he won the election with uh, enormous uh, support, 1881. He comes to the parliament for taking oath as the parliament member. And as a team that uh, uh, Charles Bradlow and Annie Besant, his uh, strong aid and supporter at his side, they decided that he would not take oath in the name of God. That was not possible in the British parliament at the time. Bratlow has written about that. He was confused, but it was the young Annie Besant gave him strength to take that decision. He wanted it, but he was really puzzled at that moment whether to lose the parliament membership or insist on this position. And that insistence has changed the history in so many countries. And the person behind that was the inspiring Annie Besant. Bradler has written about that, how influential she was on that moment. So he goes to the parliament, refuses to take oath in the name of God. He said, I would take oath on my name solemnly affirm. The law said, no, you cannot do that. The speaker said, you cannot take an oath like that. So they decided, they asked, repeatedly asked him many times, and he said, no, he would not do that. And the parliament votes to cancel his parliament membership, and then asked for a new election. And the party was asked to select a new, new leader, I mean, to, a person to contest. So then he contests again. So the party, in, in his political party, there was a, a movement that he should be exchanged now with another person because they want the parliament seat. But the party supported him and he contested again. And he filed a series of cases against the system to establish his position. Then he was re-elected with more votes, comes to the parliament again, and he was refused to get a, a membership in the parliament or he cannot become a, a member of parliament because he cannot take an oath in the name of God. He loses the parliament membership again. Then he goes again a third time and uh, it goes on and on many times. And finally, the whole public opinion turned in his favor. There were articles, there were public speeches, the demand for his entry into the parliament. The British parliament finally passed a new law to accept a person as member of parliament without taking oath in the name of God. Instead, a word, an alternative option was given, solemnly affirm. I solemnly affirm. I mean, one's uh, support of the, the system and everything. I mean, like, like what we have. But this law, once established in Britain, it got into all the British colonies. You know, in India, for example, Indian constitution says very clearly that you can, at two occasions, you need religious texts. For example, if you are in a court of law, if you are accused or if you are a witness, you have to hold a religious text and say that in the name of God, I mean, touch a book and you have to say it. But you have another option. You can simply say that I don't believe in any religion. Therefore, I want to do it solemnly affirm. It's very clearly possible. All court of laws, all courts of law agree people to, I mean, do it. But not only in India, but almost all the former British colonies. Meantime, I mean, you have uh, the French Revolution, which was establishing another secular structure in, in Europe with the great slogans, liberty, equality, and fraternity, and denounced the entire churches and thrown off the connection, the papal authorities, representatives of the papal authority in, in France, and established a secular government in France. So Europe was changing. The Enlightenment reached its peak. I mean, that's the French Revolution is considered to the the, the last point of the Enlightenment movement. Now in Britain, a similar thing is happening and he is insisting. There are a lot of other, other elements also in the British political system that was changing, but this is a crucial information because this is connected with the Annie Besant. So now the, after the whole by-elections, the last by-election before he was 
finally thrown off before his last last election the parliament decides to eject him out of parliament if you read gandhi's experiments with truth his autobiography you can read a paragraph about that the young gandhi who was a barrister student in london was there outside the parliament to witness how this guy is pushed off from the parliament there are legends about how he was thrown off some people say that he was taken by the chair and thrown off some people say that he was hauled by hand and thrown i mean pushed out but he refused he was taken into parliament jail gandhi was in the crowd watching this event of his i mean on the fourth or fifth election when he clinged on his chair and refused to go out of the parliament because he was elected by the people and he wanted to uh, take the oath encouraging him was young anibasant and he was out he was in the jail and the barrister student gandhi who was interested in secular ideas and rationalist ideas at that time visits charles bradlow in the jail he meets anibasant the young assistant of charles bradlow also at that time later that leads to another great connection he, he again she comes to india and meets gandhi when he is leading the indian independence struggle that's another way of history's course so gandhi after the, his examination he becomes a lawyer he becomes a barrister he goes to south africa but in britain charles bradlow makes his shows and i mean finally he becomes a parliament member first time in the history of modern world somebody goes to the parliament without taking oath in the name of god and he was very successful he was a very successful parliamentarian and he demanded for india's home rule where did perhaps gandhi get the idea of india's home rule the young barrister student who was in london was it from charles bradlow some writers say that it was his association with charles bradlow who supported india's home rule he was against the colonial rule over india and apparently gandhi got the clue from a barrister student from charles bradlow charles bradlow closely associated with congress party i mean for a long time if you remember the history of the, the lahore congress of the indian national congress later was they, they had a memorial hall that's charles bradlow memo- i mean hall unfortunately that's in lahore now the lahore congress it, at, at that time it was undivided india La- lahore was part of india and the lahore congress of indian national congress made a hall in the memorial of charles bradlow and that's in that's in lahore now so charles bradlow influenced the whole structure i mean in and around the life of uh, any besant so but then he establishes the national secular society the one of the first rationalist organizations in britain as yes, i told you was the south place ethical society but it was on one part of tender the south place ethical society and the convoy hall is still there near the tube uh, the russell uh, but uh, one national organization emerges national secular society charles bradlow was the person in front of the organization and the person behind the whole organization was any person she felt she bratla is her mentor and bratla felt she is the inspiration behind the whole thing that was the kind of relationship so there some people say that it was a great affair some some other people that it was something like a great teacher and a disciple some other people say that great friends nobody knows they don't speak too much about their private relationship but people guess a lot of things and how intimate they were and there were stories that she was the young lover of charles bratla there are books speaking about that but i don't want to go into that but they were so closely associated so closely associated associated with every aspect of their public life charles bratla dies and the national secular society needs a new leader so there was an election now two candidates at that time any percent tried to look for a successor to charles bratla with that kind of stature she found a one member bernard shaw bernard shaw was member of a national secular society and she convinced bernard shaw to contest to become the president of the national secular society but the power of any percent in the organization was a, a point of envy for a lot of people people were accepting the authority of charles bratla but once charles bratla what was not there some of the people i mean they didn't feel that uh, again another person who has a great influence from any percent should not be on the power so charles bratla lost the election for a few votes and there was one johnson who becomes the president charles bratla was not elected he was defeated in the election for the presidency of the national secular society so any person was very frustrated so what happens she remained uh, i mean some days in uh, in britain and uh, she she wanted to do things and her organization was the national secular society and charles bradlaw is no more and her nominee is not elected 
and they started sightlining her. That was a sad story. They simply started sightlining her. And one, you know, uh, practically she was alienated from the whole scene. Some people say that, uh, I mean, during the political activities of Charles Bradley itself, she was a little bit alienated from the work because she was a skilled organizer, a real good, uh, I mean, speaker, and a perfect manager for whatever Charles Bradley was doing. She wanted to have a person like that to support and help. Well, I mean, then um, uh, she goes to the World Religious Congress in Chicago. You know, the famous religious congress, uh, the World Parliament of Religions, that's how it is called in Chicago, where uh, Swami Vivekananda makes his very famous speech about Indian religion. And she meets Vivekananda in this uh, conference. That was 1893. She represents a new organization that she made, the Theosophical Society. She goes there. But interestingly, in that conference, there are many other people also, I mean, uh, who would otherwise become unknown, I mean, because of that. For example, uh, there were, I, I've read that uh, Gandhi himself was a part of this conference, representing some communities, which is to be, I mean, verified again, but I've read about that. But anyway, the, as a pres the president of the a theosophical society at that time was Henry Steele Olcott, but she was representing the Theosophical Society. She was part of the, the Theosophical Movement. Theosophical Movement was something like, a, it's a kind of a Buddhist school. I mean, a, a school of thought, blending ideas of Buddhism, meditation, kind of a critical thinking, rationalism, everything is blended together into one pack. That was Theosophical Society. Let's go into the Theosophical Society and its, its content later another time. But the life and times of Annie Besant is what I was trying to speak about. Annie Besant, after that, she become, I mean, fascinated with the Bernard Shah. And then, then Bernard Shah has another organization, the Fabian Society. So she tries to uh, become part of the Fabian Society. Uh, so was thinking, Bernard Shah was thinking about alternatives to capitalist system. He was not convinced with Marxism per se. Marxism was not a viable alternative. Even before the establishment of Soviet Union and all, I mean, he found that it, it has a lot of dogmatic structures. And he found a new idea, which is known as Fabian uh, Socialism. And he joins the Fabian Society. And Annie Besant was also part of the Fabian Society. Um, so then there are two schools. Whether there was a split between Bernard Shaw and Charles Bradler, or a split because of Annie Besant. Did Annie Besant actually shift her loyalties from Charles Bradla to Bernard Shaw? That was one major allegation that was brought against her when she wanted to bring in Bernard Shaw as the president of the National Secular Society, which is disputed by a lot of people. It could be just a fabricated story, but she was interested in Fabian socialism, was very clear. But, uh, well, uh, that did not work. And... Uh, so in, in Britain, it, doesn't, it did not get any, any currency. She would uh, slowly think of moving to India. That's a major change in her life. What has actually provoked her to go to India? So many people say that it could be her frustration with the British socialist movement or the Fabian socialist movement. Some other people say that her earlier connection with uh, Madame Blavatsky could be one kind of influence. Blavatsky believed that the Indian saints have a lot of power. They have magical powers and all she believed. And I mean, she spoke a lot about that, just a little bit exaggerated kind of ideas. She believed in a kind of a reasonable society, but the special powers that people can attain was something that she fascinated with. Okay, then Annie Besant become a friend of the daughter of Karl Marx, Eleanor Marx. She become very closely friend of Eleanor Marx. She was living in Brendan and in, in London. So then she thought of uh, moving to Marxism again. No, but she doesn't move to Marxism. She still go to the Fabian movement and then joins the Socialist League. It's a small sprinter Marxist group at that time, one can say. Those kind of uh, Marxist groups in London at that time sometimes supported the Labour Party in elections. They spoke about the trade union movement, but not really kind of modern day Marxist movement. Okay, then, then one sees that she's uh, more and more interested in the political activities. It does not really get currency. And she feels that she has a new life. And uh, so she is more and more in connection with uh, Blavatsky, Blavatsky, whom she met in uh, uh, Chicago. And then Blavatsky has written a book, 
the secret doctrine. So she believes that there are some secret doctrines uh, existing in the Indian system. And it's a kind of a magical thinking. And she was uh, fascinated with her idea and decided to come to India. But when she, she wanted to come to India, there was an interesting phenomenon happening. Whom she should meet first, she thought. When she comes to India, she was fascinated with two people. One was Rabindranath Tagore. There was another face of her also. Many of you may be knowing about the Freemasonry movement. That's a kind of elitist movement, uh, a kind of, a, I mean, group of free thinkers who would practice a kind of true brotherhood, but a secret society, which would make, try to make a new world order, international order of Freemasonry of men and women. So they, they were making plans about free thought revolutions in many countries and uh, I mean, giving intellectual leadership to all these kinds of things. This was a secret society and she was also a part of this uh, secret society. So then eventually she becomes the president of the Theosophical Society in 1894. Uh, and then she has a shift of thought. She tries to think that the occult really works. How to explain the, the, the magic? She thought probably there should be some scientific reasons for all these kinds of things. She tries to imagine about some kind of chemistry working in the whole thing. There could be a universal chemistry working in the whole thing. So then she tries to become a co-author of a book, namely The Occult Chemistry. So that, that's a transformation, the magical thinking and the Hindu mythical thinking, not the religious Hindu, but the mythical Hindu is something is what she was very fascinated. But uh, she became controversial with a lot of statements. One of the major controversies, uh, connection with the, I mean, the, 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 her participation in the, in the, in the movement of the, uh, what you call the Freemasonry and uh, her second change to the occult idea, she started coming closer to people like Leadbeater. Leadbeater is a person who claimed clairvoyance. Clairvoyance is something like you, you can look at a cloak and stop it. You can look into somebody's eyes and you can get them collapsed. These kind of magical thinking. And these kind of people were very active in Britain at that time. If you remember, the occult groups and the spiritual societies were so active in Britain at that time. Every little street had an occult practitioner there, as well as spiritual medium. That was something which we do not know. At that time, these people claimed, like, like the astrologers in India who would say that, I mean, they, they are able to tell about your future. The British, uh, I mean, what you call this, um, uh, there's a special word that the medium. The medium, uh, you would go to a medium and then you pay some money and you will be asked to sit in a room and they will put your hand on their hand. Then there will be a, a kind of a small instrument, which is very close to the, the Ojo board of, at this time. And then they would speak some words and then they asked to rotate it and they are communicating with the spirits of people who are dead. You can talk to a dead grandfather or you can talk to your dead mother, anybody you can talk to. These kind of people were so active in Britain. Every single street had many occult practitioners, there were many medium practicing in Britain at that time. And very famous people in Britain became followers of this idea. I can tell one name, I mean, immediately. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes, was an ardent follower of this belief. He believed in mediums and he claimed that, I mean, he can talk to spirits. And, uh, well, I mean, the, the kind of, you know, the short mindset that he has shown as an author of, I mean, Sherlock Holmes stories is not there. It's absent when he thinks about occult. He believed that this all would work. And Joseph Rin, the then leader of the critical moment against this, I've been exposing Arthur Conan Doyle and his, how he got into trapped with all, by all these people and how they use him as a major campaign point. Anyway, any percent get involved in the occult ideas, clairvoyance, occult chemistry and all these kind of things. She started thinking that there could be something possible with all these magical things. There could be the spiritual healing possible. There could be spiritual mediums coming and talking to people. There could be some universal chemistry working. She got somehow frustrated, it seems. Some, somehow he got, she got completely on the wrong path after a great past in the rationalist moment. That's, that's the irony of Annie Besant. But there's a huge change when she comes to India. She goes to Rabindranath Tagore when she came to India. Rabindranath Tagore ridiculed her. 
told that these all are absurd. You are frustrated because Charles Bratla is no more in your life and uh, he has died and uh, Bernard Shah has died and you are completely, I mean, without a, a proper leading and you are not a person of your own. You need somebody to guide you. That's perhaps one of the reasons. There was, I mean, private notes about, I mean, he, her meeting with uh, Devindranath Tagore. Devindranath Tagore did not believe in all these kind of occult and said that these are absurd stories. One should not follow this. Rather, one should concentrate in helping India's home rule. That was it. Then she's, one sees she's getting interested in Theravada Buddhism. So she has some kind of a, a, a spiritual orientation. Then she finds, okay, the Theravada Buddhism, which is denouncing the, the traditional faith and religion and the kind of uh, belief in God, could be something she found more uh, interested in. So, so then the uh, ideas of esoteric Christianity, esoteric Buddhism, and a part of Theravada Buddhism all started, you know, boiling in her mind. So she become more and more fascinated with the magical possibilities of all this. Something like the present day gurus, what they would claim she started believing in. She got more and more associated with the, the Hindu movement of those times, which is closely associated with the Indian National Congress. At that time in India, one has to also remember that in India, the Britishers were promoting a person namely Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan because they wanted to encourage a Muslim nationalism in India as against the Hindu nationalism uh, initiated by Madan Mohan Malaviya and Balagangadra Tilak and all these kind of people. And they wanted to promote a counter-Muslim nationalist movement, which eventually paved way for the establishment of Pakistan. So Aligarh College was found. That is one stream of India's freedom movement supported by the British movement, but enlightenment of the Muslim community was the goal of it. On the other side, Pandit Madan Mohan Malaviya uh, and Basant together decides that there should be a Hindu university. And they were the founders. Ani Basant and Madan Mohan, Mohan Malaviya are the founders of the Banaras Hindu University. Madan Mohan Malaviya was the president of Indian National Congress also. So then um, the ultimate truth or the spiritual hierarchy and all these kind of things that Blavatsky was speaking about. Blavatsky was another person. I mean, she is a, a, a person with Russian origin, but was fascinated with the Indian magical thinking, thought about the occult and the magical healing and the Indian spiritual powers and all these kind of things. I mean, she believed that uh, the Indian gurus are flying on carpets and all these kind of stories were spread by her. She believed that all these powers really exist. Something the modern day Indian rationalists would fight against is what... Uh, Annie Besant was fascinated, who had a great rationalist background at that time. But imagine, uh, if you speak about those the rationalists of those times, or the free thinkers of those times, uh, Bernard Shah believed in homeopathy, because there was no critical thinking properly count, coming out at that time. I mean, there was a lot of people interested in the anti-religious movement only. Scientific attitude and anti-religious movement are two different things. The free thought movement always focused on a non-religious society, but not scientific thinking. That is why the, the rationalist movement at that time, in 1901, when the rationalist movement emerges in Britain, that was the key of its change. Till then, there was the free thought societies in Britain. Free thought societies concentrate on, on one thing, separation of state and religion, separation of uh, religion and uh, education system, and partially separation of religion and morality, but did not use scientific attitude. So the rationalist society emerges in Britain. So if you call whether Annie Besant was part of the rationalist movement, no. Many people would call her a rationalist, but she was not part of the rationalist movement. She was part of the National Secular Society and the, the uh, what you call the Charles Bradlaugh's movement, the South Place Ethical Society, and then Fabian Society, and then she shifted to the idea of occult. Still, she was insisting on separation of state and religion. So a free thinker mainly is a political activist who would ask for separation from state and religion, but on matters of other things, scientific attitude is not used by them. That was the classical difference between the free thought movement and the rationalist movement. And the rationalist movement took up with a lot of new publications. So a new set of ideas were brought in. Huxley was one of the key figures of the rationalist movement. Bertrand Russell was another key figure of the, figure of the rationalist movement. They all spoke about scientific attitude, critical thinking as, as against the idea of classical separation of state and religion, they insisted on critical thinking as a way of seeing things. So they, they started Riddle of Universe by 
Huxley was published by the, the Thinkers Library of Rationalist Press Association. Then Charles Bradler's uh, uh, books were also published, but about state and religion separation. They also published a lot of books from Charles Darwin. Original Species was, uh, I mean, reprinted by the Thinkers Library, and Huxley became the champion of the idea of evolution, which which was still struggling to get universal acceptance at that time in the British society. So then we see the new effort of Annie Besant in India. Lee Beat was an interesting person, who was the president of the, who, whom she considered uh, a world teacher should emerge. That's what Lee Beat said. Lee Beat was the person who was uh, taking her into the spiritual hierarchy world and all these kind of funny ideas. And he suggested that there shall be a new world leader emerge, and he should be perfectly trained to lead the world in the right way. And we should discover such a person. That was an idea of this person. So Annie Besant decides to locate a person. She finds a young man, 14 years, who is later known as Jiddu Krishnamurti, J. Krishnamurti. Born in 1895, Jiddu became a South Indian boy. I mean, uh, half Tamil and uh, half maybe Malayali, one can say, and uh, who had been living with his father and a brother. And uh, he was later living in the Theosophical Society's headquarters. And uh, now Annie Besant gets a new idea. She declares him as the, he is the vehicle for the expected world teacher. Well, uh, so now he is groomed as the world teacher in the, in the, in the future. Meantime, Annie Besant is interested in the Indian freedom struggle. She goes and meets Gandhi. And the old connection, Gandhi met Annie Besant as a young assistant of uh, Charles Bratlow. And uh, of course, Gandhi has gone to South Africa. He came back to India. And now he's leading the Indian national movement. There are two theories. I mean, who called Gandhi a Mahatma? Was it Rabindranath Tagore or Annie Besant? Perhaps both. Anyway, one school of thought says that, I mean, it was Annie Besant who suggested this name, Mahatma Gandhi, the great man, great soul, whatever it is. Some other people said it was perhaps Rabindranath Tagore said it, but upon the suggestion of Annie Besant. Anyway, Annie Besant was part of making Gandhi the way he is seen by the public now. She assists Gandhi and supports Gandhi and becomes a part of the International Congress and was also elected as the president of International Congress. She was a very strong activist for the Indian National Congress and India's freedom struggle. But on the other side, she was busy with theosophical society and all this occult, and also associating with Madan Mohan Malavi and establishing the Banaras Hindu University. And, you know, it's a mixture of a uh, kind of occult superstition, then a kind of Theravada Buddhism, Theosophy, Gandhi, Rabindranath Tagore. She was a mixture of many things. But the fundamental principle that she had that state and religion shall be separated. That, despite her spirituality, despite her newfound theosophy, despite her belief in occult, the free thinker in her worked very well. The free thinker normally, I mean, as I, I mean, in India, the word has a different meaning, but world over, free thought movement is a movement not focusing mainly on the scientific attitude or scientific tempo, but on separation of state and religion. So she insisted on non-interference of religion in the political scene. And that made an issue for her against Gandhi. In 1914, I mean, when the World War begins, Britain and uh, Turkey are on, on opposite sides. The present day Turkey, then the headquarters of the Ottoman Empire, was completely dismantled during the war. When Britain was fighting against Turkey, the situation prevailed there was very different. The Sultan of Turkey was the caliph of the all Muslims of the whole world. He has a status like the Pope of the Catholics. The whole Muslims of the whole world considered the Caliph of, of the Ottoman Empire as the worldwide leader of the whole movement. So that was the Caliphate at the time. But when Britain started fighting against Turkey, there was a movement which was known as the Khilafat movement. It means those who support the, the authority of the Caliph should be against all those people who are fighting the Caliph against the Ottoman Empire. Logically, what it means, Britain is fighting against the, uh, the, the Caliphate or the Turkey or the Ottoman Empire. Therefore, Britain is fighting against the Caliphate. So a Khilafat movement has started in many parts of the world, in, mainly in South Asia. And suddenly, Gandhi understood this as an opportunity because he was disturbed by the growing Hindu Muslim nationalist movement on the other side with the support of the British movement, British, with the support of the British government. The Aligarh movement, Muslim, uh, the, the Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan and all these kind of people were supported by the British uh, authorities. And I mean, it was a growing promotion of the Muslim nationalist movement. 
very loyal to the British government at that time. So the Indian National Congress, as well as the Hindu Mahasabha of those times, we are working hand in hand. And Madan Mohan Malaviya, for example, the president of Indian National Congress also was the president of the Hindu Mahasabha. So was the Balaganga Tilak, I mean, the, who was the leader of Congress party before Gandhi, was a famous or uh, Hindu activist who started the Ganesh also in uh, Maharashtra and Mumbai, and very much in the direction of conventional Hinduism with the Brahmanic authority. So there was a, a politician in Gandhi wanted to grab this opportunity, and he announced support to the uh, Khilafat movement, means asking the Muslim to join the Congress party because Congress is supporting the Khilafat movement against because they, they should all fight against the Britishers because Britishers are fighting the Khalifa's authority. Look, what kind of a round way. It was, it was a big success in the beginning. A lot of Muslims got attracted to it, especially Muslim radicals. That was a wrong policy of Gandhi. And when this was you know, presented in the International Congress meeting, you know, who were the people who opposed it? The founding father of Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who was a Congress leader at that time, was a secularist. He said, this is an absurd idea. You should not do that. There shall not be any mixing up of politics and religion. He opposed Gandhi. There are reports that, I mean, he was howled and pulled down. And I mean, he was humiliated. And he, was, he left the stage very unhappy. And he left India, went to Britain. And later he re-emerged as the leader of the Pakistan movement. Political opportunism at one side. A lot of political changes, people changing dramatic positions, you could see at that time. So Annie Besant was one person who opposed Gandhi on this point. She insisted no Khilafat movement. She was on the Banaras Hindu University movement, which was a counter to the Aligarh movement. That was a Hindu movement against the Muslim na nationalist movement. She was part of that. Uh, that was perhaps the reason some people say. Some other people say that her fundamental ideas of separation of state and religion that she got from Charles Bratlow and Bernard Shah probably was the reason. But in the Calicut session of Congress, there was a local session at that time. Gandhi was pleading for the support of all Muslims to Indian National Congress because Congress was supporting the Khilafat movement. Annie Besant publicly denounced Gandhi's position, challenged it. But Gandhi was very powerful. Gandhi's will prevailed and it was voted in, in Gandhi's favor. So that was her loss of interest in the Congress party at that time. She moves more and more to the Theosophical Society and trying to bring up Jiddu Krishnamurti as the new world leader coming up. There are two people, uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti and his younger brother, uh, Nityananda, who was called Nitya. So they were presented, they were groomed as the future mission, as the world teachers. And uh, she was the kind of a legal guardian of the whole, uh, the two brothers. And uh, then there was a legal battle. Uh, her father, the father of Jiddu, asked that the guardianship should be changed because it's against the will of these boys that she's keeping the boys to be the world leaders. And uh, so Krishnamurti was very close with uh, uh, Basant, accepted her role as the surrogate mother. So his biological mother died. And uh, of course, I mean, he accepted her as the mother. But uh, the World Teacher, Teacher Project became, the, the Theosophy's hope was there's a world teacher coming up and they're grooming Jiddu Krishnamurti to be the girl, global leader, order of the star in the East. That is how they presented him. So he would emerge and organize the whole world I mean, towards something more in, in the lines of theosophy and et cetera, et cetera. So a new society was made, the Krishnamurti Foundation of India. But Krishnamurti, he started thinking in the critical direction. He denounced the whole structure. He said he is no world leader. He, he was groomed wrongly to be in this position. And he started speaking in a very different, I mean, very informed way he started speaking. Of course, it's a mixture of little, what would say that, I mean, broad uh, spirituality in a form, but no God or anything of that sort. He denounced everything, but he spoke in a different language. He denounced all this occult. He denounced all, the, all this magical thinking. He started an idea, something closer to an elevated Hinduism, closer to Advaita, one could say, and a part of elevated spiritualism. So Jiddu Krishnamurti, I mean, Jiddu's, Jiddu was very active as a speaker. His books are still available on Penguin paperbacks. And one can read it. You can see that you can see a very enlightened person there, but not perhaps like a rationalist, but speaking very rationally on many things. And he denounced the whole idea that he was, I mean, that he's, he was a world master in making. He said, that's a ridiculous idea. Nobody can be a world master. I'm certainly not one. 
he said. So that was it. So in 1914, uh, Basant had a serious problem because the Br Britain asked that everybody should support the British government, all colonies and every, everyone. So 1916, she started a movement, the All India Home Rule League. And Balagangadra Tilak or Lokaman Tilak was uh, along with her at that time. That's how she becomes very prominent in the Congress party. She was arrested in 1917 because she was very staunchly opposing the British position. So she was not liked by, for example, the Muslim League did not like her, as well as a major section in the Congress did not like her. But she was a very powerful force in the Congress party. So this is what she was. Then one sees that the Indian national movement was going around Gandhi. And uh, I mean, Jawaharlal Nehru emerges as a more powerful leader. And eventually, Basant's position declines in the Congress. She becomes more and more active in the Theosophical Society. And uh, she tries to, again, bring up uh, the Krishnamurti as uh, she tries to win Krishnamurti to accept that he is the forthcoming world leader or global leader. Krishnamurti, he, she permanently, I mean, tried to convince him. He did not agree to become the world leader, something like that. He said, that's a wrong idea. She was unhappy. One would see that Krishnamurti still loved Annie Basant and considered her as a mother. And they remained very close friends, but they did not. Their motives and objectives changed. Krishnamurti went more to the rational side, leaving behind now change theosophical or more spiritual Annie Basant. And Krishnamurti becomes something like Annie Basant should have been with the Charles Bratla's background. Basan dies in 19, I mean, she died in 1933 in Adair in Madras, and she was, her body was cremated there. And the Theosophical Society has branches everywhere. And uh, even in uh, Trivandrum in Kerala, in Sri Lanka, in many other parts, Adair in Madras is the major headquarters of a Theosophical Society. And there is a, there is a Happy Valley, Basan Hill School of Happy Valley. I mean, there is a school in California in her memorial. So these all are very popular sports in the memory of uh, Annie Besant, she perhaps ended up as a person whom she was actually destined to become. Somehow she got confused. That confusion has damaged her potential. The way she was coming up in Britain perhaps was totally shifted to a new direction because of her visit to the World Parliament of Religions and her meeting with Madame Blavatsky. She influenced her to occultism, this, uh, this uh, spirituality and all these kind of things, but it got confused with her uh, rationalism or, or I, would, I would say the free thought ideas or secularism on the other side. And she tried to blend these, these two together and got utterly confused. But she made enormous powerful contribution in the freedom struggle of India and was a leader of the Indian National Congress. And her contribution was enormous. And she again, she was very, very, I mean, supportive person for Gandhi. On a lot of occasions, she has given very serious and practical advices to Gandhi. Many times he has taken her advice also. And she contributed a lot, but as a person who did not have consistency of ideas, got confused here and there. One would say that she was best with when she was with Charles Bratla. And she was also good with uh, Bernard Shah. And after that, there is a decline of Annie Besant. Then you see a spark in her coming up during the India's independence struggle. That's the second, second big achievement of her. And then she, I would say, the fall from Charles Bratla's most loved assistant to a magical thinker and a, a person who believed in occult and even denounced by the person whom she wanted to build up as the world leader in her, with her ideas. She became a, a kind of a sad person uh, at the last part of her life, perhaps she understood what mistakes she has done in her life. But uh, her contributions would remain ever, I mean, because that was an important contribution to the history of modern thinking, the history of modern politics, history of India's independence struggle, and the history of the secularist movement. But no person who influenced history was perfect. Annie Besant made wonderful contributions. She made serious mistakes also. But what is more important I would say that she turned into occultism was a mistake. She turned into spirituality was a wrong path she was interested in. Her uh, in belief in uh, all these kind of magical thinking and I mean spiritual world, but without losing the idea of secularism and uh, separation of state and religion, she tried to mix these two, these two ideas together, got her a confused person. That doesn't take away the importance of her. That doesn't 
take away her major contribution as a strong supporter and assistant of Charles Bratla and Bernard Shah and Gandhi and even Rabindranath Tagore and even Madan Mohan Malaviya in the establishment of the university there. She would be remembered and if one takes history without blind praising, understanding the shades and light of a person's life, I would say that there is more light that we see than the dark shades that she left behind. Thank you very much. Yes, I think we can move on to the question answer round. Can I ask you one question? Or, uh, please, please, please. Yeah, actually, I think the evolution of Sri Lanka is uh, parallel to the evolution of industrialization. Uh, are you right, sir? Uh, the evolution of free thought movement and? And the industrialization or scientific progress. Yeah, I, I think the, both to the, the second part I didn't understand. That means the scientific progress of the world is uh, directly connected to the evolution of free thinkers. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I didn't get the word evolution. Yeah. The free thought movement was not a movement connected with scientific th- thinking. It was a major political, it was mainly a political movement against the authority of churches and religions and their connection to the state. So it was almost a fulfillment of the, the Enlightenment movement, which was a scientific movement, in fact. Enlightenment movement was a scientific movement. It was for scientific, uh, I mean, attitude and critical inquiry. But it t- turned to political movement, especially after the French Revolution. What we see is a major shift of focus from scientific thinking or scientific enlightenment to political enlightenment. These are two different things. Political enlightenment was an a parallel idea which was going on, the growth of democracy, the growth of the idea of separation of state and religion, and the growth of the idea of human rights as part of the political scene. So these, these were the two, two, three other contributions of the Enlightenment movement. So in the twofold growth of the Enlightenment movement would go to the political movement with the free thought ideas. Free thought has a different meaning, as I rightly told. I mean, it's used in a very different context in many parts, I mean, especially in India at this moment. But the free thought movement everywhere in the world is the movement that focuses on separation of state and religion. The focus on, on scientific attitude is mainly taken up by the rationalist movement and the skeptic movement. And um, so this was the major problem that was affecting Annie Besant. The secularist movement at one side and the scientific attitude movement or the rationalist movement on the other side was going parallelly from the beginning of 1900s. So she was part of the free thought movement. So she did not care for the scientific attitude much, but she wanted to have a separation of state and religion and promoted that idea. Both are, I mean, what products of the enlightened movement. It's an evolution going into two different channels. That's the right way of saying it. Thank you. Yes, good evening. The talk was very good. And uh, so Annie Basandu showed us how to do free thinking away from religion. And uh, I think she showed leadership and also she was a woman. I think that she inspired us. Uh, so Indira Gandhi became prime minister. She was the second, I think first prime minister of the uh, world and then uh, British prime minister came after Indra, I think. So that's uh, one way of teaching what to do. And then, uh, the, you know, um, then uh, Charles Butler showed us we don't have to hold the Bible and and take a oath to be a political leader. Uh, I think that's that's another thing. So she was a teacher, and also she showed us how to behave in, in a public arena and become the head of a country. Uh, I think that's what we learned from her and her contributions uh, very much uh, remembered throughout India as well as uh, throughout the world, maybe especially in Britain and in Mr. Channel uh, helped us to see this and spend his time to show us what it is. And thank you very much. I really don't have a question except to the uh, good things we learned from her leadership. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I would say that Annie Besant is a very interesting person. Uh, she she got, you know, uh, absolutist ideas. That perhaps was her major problem. She believed perhaps that there is a final truth, the secret or, or hidden spiritual hierarchy that Madame Blavatsky was speaking, all these kind of things. 
she got since she was part of the freemasonry movement i mean their ideas also perhaps was uh, part of her uh, changes or was she simply confused she she had another mentor i mean as i told you i mean uh, for example the charles webster leadbeater who was uh, the fellow theosophist of her so he was in the midst of a lot of interesting controversies so he also spoke about clairvoyance clairvoyance is uh, one could move things by mental thought they believed in power of the brain which leaves waves and i mean that can influence things an absurd idea which cannot scientifically substantiate and i mean it was i mean ridiculed by all people who are seriously taking scientific thinking but a person like Annie Besant, who was part of uh, the National Secular Society at one time, was speaking about such things. So Lidbeta was a very controversial person. For example, he asked, for example, those times, 1800s, late 1800s, he asked boys to masturbate because that was considered the biggest sin for the churches at that time. He asked that all boys should masturbate publicly. And that was a huge controversy at that time. So she defended that. Also, she spoke in favor of the right of uh, abortion at that time. Again, a very positive stance. at that time so these were thinking ahead of times ahead of the traditional faith people had about many things but all the same she was somehow fascinated with this occult ideas and i mean hidden secret magical powers and secret hierarchy and all these kind of things and uh, if she was not fallen into this trap of uh, confusion her position in the history of free thought movement would be much much higher if you see the a, a parallel you can see in the life of indira gandhi popul jaker has written a book about indira gandhi indira gandhi was a very critical person thinking uh, very critically i mean as the daughter of jawala nehru and all but after the losing of power the first time when she came the second time she started believing in black magic she always thought that uh, somebody is doing black magic against her she was worried about that she had nightmares Pupul Jaikar was mentioning about that. I mean, she tried to tell her that there is nothing of that sort. But somehow she, all these gurus gave an idea of black magic and I mean, people are trying to haunt. I mean, she was demons who are haunting her and all these kind of strange ideas Mrs. Gandhi had is what Pupul Jaikar writes in her biography of Indira Gandhi. One sees sometimes people, when they become old, they get confused and people, whatever they say, are taken very seriously. But I would like to... F- wish uh, i mean which is a, a meaningless wish because i mean she's no more but if she was not fallen into this trap of uh, confusion in her life her she would have been valued very much but we cannot say that a person is a person the what she is so we have to understand her the way she is with her absurdities and with her contribution and when we accept a person when we evaluate a person we would see both sides and her contribution was very great she was a leading figure in the thought process she was a leading free thinker in britain she was a leading person who promoted the idea of separation of state and religion she was a really really supporting hand for two major people charles bradlaugh as well as bernard shaw but then she falls into a trap of uh, occultism thank you anyway that was just expanding what i was telling earlier uh, thank you very much uh, so what i learned when i think about mrs gandhi she is lioness of india then afterwards margaret thatcher of britain became same as she but i didn't know mrs besant talked about open masturbation i don't think that's a good idea uh, people may have a different idea that's why still margaret annie besant uh, um, has a great position in history of india as well as in britain thank you mrs sanam yeah, i think it's, it's a wrong wrong understanding she did not ask for open masturbation masturbation was considered wrong at that time it was a sin at that time 1800s most of the religions promoted that as a sin at that time they educated young boys to freely practice masturbation that was a revolution at that time to publicly speak like that and that's nothing wrong and you can do whenever you want that's what they said and also educated the idea of one's right to have abortion so that is something in 1800s if somebody speaks like that that is the meaning that's what i said if somebody speaks now that is a common knowledge everyone knows that but uh, that is the importance i mean it's 200 years from now i mean if somebody was speaking like that and publicly speaking in a very conventional british society of those times that was something radical thank you good evening sir good evening yeah it's very interesting to know about any vision because we have only known her from theosophical societies but to know what she was doing before that that was not very much you know means before she came to india what she was doing was not very much propagated in our 
means whatever we have studied in school and other places. So my one first question means I will have two part. One is this that about this uh, J Krishna Murti thing. So what is your view about J Krishna Murti? Because uh, I think you can have another separate program itself about J Krishna Murti. Because I find lot of people in means this my circle. Middle class or you know little uh, people who are educated, following J. Krishna Murthy's uh, teachings and whatever I think, and they say that he is not actually a guru, and he himself said that he is not a guru. But when I read some things of what he has said about mindfulness and meditation, he sounded like another guru to me only. So, what is the influence of any Bhisant on? Okay, J. Krishna Murthy had. Left theosophical society, but what was her influence on him, and in spreading this? Because I think that this is another type of uh, spiritual or religious thing. This is my first question. Second question, I will ask later. Yeah, uh, Krishna Murthy was uh, located by Ani Besant when he was fourteen years. Ani Besant had a strange idea. See, there is a secret spiritual order. Is what she believed. So therefore, she wanted a top leader of the world emerge. So she tried to groom him. She tried to groom him, but uh, he understood things. You know, he was more fascinated with the earlier part of Annie Besant, not the occult Annie Besant. So if you if you read what Krishnamurti has written, he speaks sensibly on many things. He is very sensible on many things. He has this backdrop also. He would go for meditation, but not meditation to find any god or anything. He didn't believe in any god, but he speaks about mindfulness. Partially, I mean, see meditation. One has to also understand that you know peace of mind from uh, is is an idea connected with meditation for many people in the Western world. It's not anything religious. If you see Sam Harris, for example, he speaks about mindfulness and uh, I mean meditation and all. That's another way of say seeing it. But I would say that I mean it's a kind of uh, going into all these kind of things which is unnecessary. You can attain it by simply understanding that you need to relax. Very simple like that. So also, most of these people do not connect the kind of blind faith and occult faith connected to meditation, and they try to present it as a corporate idea to get relaxed or something like that. So Krishnamurti was trying to find a non-spiritual explanation for meditation, and he called it mindfulness, not any spiritual achievement. He didn't believe in any any Kundalini or anything. He said such things. He was not accepting. He was more on using meditation as a kind of Uh, what you call a, a kind of a fulfillment of your desire to be calm and quiet or things like that. That is what he was trying to say. If you read Krishna Murthy, you would see elements of um, uh, Annie Besant's thought in the earlier part of her life, and a kind of little influence of Indian spirituality to an extent. But he didn't fall into the trap of Hinduism. He did not become a Hindu. He called himself beyond all these kind of faith. Many people consider him as a rationalist. but i would say that he was still influenced by the ideas of a uh, uh, stream of spiritualism because you cannot compartmentalize everybody's opinion into this and that so krishna murti is krishna murti and you cannot really compartmentalize him anywhere he's an he's an interesting person spoke very sensibly on a lot of things but still was bit influenced with the theravada buddhism and the mindfulness and all these kind of things but a very interesting person and he denounced the whole idea of global lo- leader or he is the master of the world and all these kind of he said that's a fun i mean and my mother i mean annie besant was a, his foster mother was in a wrong idea and she was so upset because she spent her whole life to make the world master and he said i am not the master i am not a guru i am just a man simple man that's what he said uh, do you have any yeah, sir. yeah i just have another uh, question like uh, in uh, this is a little digression about about this uh, because uh, any bisant was connected with indian uh, freedom movement and we were talking about jinna so uh, as you said jinna was an opportunist but is it uh, is it not little uh, means being kind to jinna when you say he was a secularist because he was the one who started the direct action day and when the hindus were being slaughtered in pakistan he was not active in stopping that slaughtering because the first riot started in actually i think in rawalpindi or rawalpindi or peshawar i am not sure and uh, he was not that active the way gandhi or nehru were active in uh, letting the muslims stay in india so if he was really a secularist won't he have been more active in not letting the people of 
West Pakistan migrate because if you see, it is nearly a hundred percent migration of Hindus and Sikhs from West Pakistan to uh, India. Maybe because they were more uh, militarily type means martial type of people or like that from East Pakistan, there was not so much migration. But uh, I think uh, maybe we are little kind to Mr. Jinnah in saying that he was a secularist. He was a secularist. That's what I said. But I see. After the resolution for Pakistan, we don't see a Jinnah of the past. Jinnah was a secularist, is very, very clear. And in Indian National Congress, he stood for secularism. All historians would accept that. He stood for that. But once he comes back as the leader of the Muslim League, he was a different man. But uh, Jinnah, of course, I mean, he did not take a step to stop the slaughtering of, I mean, people. But who could stop it? Even Gandhi could not stop it. Millions of people were butchered on both sides. Gandhi went to Navakali when India was getting independence, barefoot and bare hand, and tell that, I mean, if you want to kill your brother and Muslim or Hindu, first kill me and all my dead body. That was Gandhi. Jinnah was not a person of that level. But Jinnah was not the only reason for the butchering of people on the basis of religion. Things were not in his hands. He was only a titular head. If you know the whole structure, it was out of the hands of any leader practically. It was taking its own semantics and it was going in its own ways. And uh, Jinnah perhaps was, uh, I mean, after establishing the country, I mean, uh, probably he wished for a moment to bring it back to secularism, but nobody would take care of his positions also. Also, Jinnah was practically neglected in Pakistan. You know, he was the father of the nation. You know how he died? He was traveling somewhere, the father of the nation, and uh, he had he had a problem with his lungs, uh, very serious ailment he had, and he was you know, breathless. And he waited, the father of the nation waited in a car without having an ambulance coming for him for more than two hours. He died a miserable death. He, they didn't care. I mean, father of the nation, when he was traveling, there was no ambulance, no doctors, no, nobody traveling along with him. They used him as a mascot for their political achievement. After that, they gave him a title, Father of the Nation, and dumped him practically. Also, I mean, he could have stopped, one would say. Also, one can say that if Gandhi could stop, I think the, the communal rights at that time were, I mean, it was beyond the possibility of any control. It was going out of hands of everybody. But I, I cannot say whether Dina wanted to stop it or not, but I can certainly vouch that in his earlier part of his life, he was a secularist and he insisted on secularism, fought with Gandhi for secularism and quarreled and left Congress for secularism. Finally, history is irony. He became the father of a Muslim homeland. Yes, sir, one thing I, sir, just one thing I would like to also say, mm. for Jinnah, like we are saying, he was not such a big Muslim, but because Jinnah himself was Aga Khani, he was not that Sunni strain or Shia, means hardcore Shia. So don't you think we are also being like, Aga Khani is anyway quite modern and an outlook. So, <laughs> means we are being a little bit more charitable to him than Ricardo. No, I Thank think you, well, no, in history, nobody gives any charity to anybody. We go for facts, isn't it? I mean, it's not, you know, we don't, we don't have to praise anybody or we don't, we don't have to denounce anybody. We have to record the facts. That's how we have to see history. Jinnah, for example, he married a Parsi. The Nusli Wadiyas, they are Jinnah's children. The owners of uh, the, the uh, what you call this, uh, the, the famous uh, cloth merchants, uh, Bombay Dai. They are Jinnah's children or grandchildren from his Parsi wife. They remained in India. So, I mean, I would say that I don't have anything in favor of Jinnah or Gandhi or anybody because I see things as a person who studies things and observes things and I would try to be truthful to the facts to the extent that I know and uh, no favor or no anger to anybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sattagiri. At last, uh, Sonal, you made a good statement that uh, Jinnah stood for secularism, born uh, with Gandhi for secularism, but the irony is he became the natural father of a Muslim nation. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ashok, please. Ashok. So, uh, okay, so only one question. Sir. Is there any relationship with Jiddu Krishnamurti and Indira Gandhi? I heard that uh, Indira Gandhi sought some advice as, uh, during the time of emergency from Jiddu Krishnamurti. And how do you write uh, anniversary in total in a tongue shell? How do you write is, is, is she a spiritual person? <laughs> uh, that's what I tried to say, basically. I mean, she was a confused person. That's what I would say. She was a very confused person. Later part of his life, she was 
absolutely superstitious on a lot of things but all the same she insisted on secularism secularism and scientific attitude are two different things free thinking and scientific attitude are two different things she was insisting on secularism but she was not insisting on scientific attitude to many things she was superstitious in many things so i mean therefore i would i would say that if i evaluate i would see the brighter side of her her contribution is very important of course i would not uh, like to appreciate many parts of what she has done but how do you give marks to people i would give 55 or 60% of marks to the positive sides and maybe i mean 40% for the the contributions which i would not really appreciate that's how i would like to see it then okay, so uh, whether krishnamurti was uh, whether indira gandhi took advice from krishnamurti or not i have not read anything of that sort Where, what's the source of that information uh, uh, thank you sir sir no no he was asking about uh, Indira Gandhi taking advices from Krishna Murthy. I was asking him what's the source of that information. Ashok, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got some information uh, because he she has some. You you mentioned Pupul Jay Jay Shankar. Uh, Pupul Jay Shankar. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. She. I, I think uh, she wrote about uh, Krishna Murthy also. She she wrote about Krishna Murthy also. I think that by her uh, she has some connection with. Uh, Krishnamurti has some connection with Indira Gandhi, and Indira Gandhi, you say that she is also you 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 mentioned that she believed in black magic something like that, and she was she was very confused at the time of emergency, and I heard that I think that from the Upul Jayashankar book or something mentioned like that she uh, sought the advice from the Krishnamurti during the time of emergency, and after the death of Indira Gandhi. uh his presence was very uh, much in the delhi and uh, something i got heard in the spiritual way well uh number 1 uh pupul jayakar's mentioning about her belief in uh, the spirit spirits haunting her and all were not known to anybody till she wrote it some people dispute it also the authenticity of that because she never publicly spoke to anybody of that sort but pupul jayakar speak about that so i have no idea whether pupul jayaka spoke about jidu krishna murti but jidu krishna murti certainly did not believe in the occult did not believe in the spirits did not believe in black magic he was a very uh, rational person on those kind of things he he did not accept all these kind of things i do not know whether they knew each other or they had any advice or anything i don't if i mean that doesn't make much of a difference because indira gandhi uh, changed to belief you know or she was afraid that her enemies are very powerful doing black magic again so she could not explain why she lost power the sense of a politician to understand things logically is something what she lost apparently in the second part of the regime is what pupul jayakar says that is because the shock that she's thrown out of power is something she could not imagine that has shattered her completely though she came back to power and uh, this this is a private fear that she had was not expressed very much of course one can see the association of uh, there is one thirendra brahmachari i mean or uh, swami sadachari making a puja when she reenters the race course road building and all i mean that one sees but more than that i mean the, the, the spiritual association was known or her fear about spirits and haunted uh, uh, feeling was known only when pupul jayakar wrote about it but written after her death not when she was alive you also have kunjazu chandra hasa with us so i would just like you to unmute yourself and proceed uh in the i am not uh, asking uh, any questions i'm just uh, adding to what uh, sanal has told regarding the uh, jinna so lk advani had uh, gone to pakistan at that time and uh, for i think uh, for releasing some book and he had praised uh, that jinna was a really a secular person and on his return uh, there was a big uh, backlash on him and uh, finally he was snubbed and uh, he was uh, shown the place and uh, today he is uh, um, he was may not given any position and uh, he became some uh, margadarshak committee was appointed so the advani a very learned man telling the jinna secular person is very apt that's what i wanted to add to the point what sanal already added that's all thank you thank you adwani was born in the part of present day pakistan and he was very closely associated with the facts that are available at that time 
But I don't know whether he was uh, politically isolated because of that, but his political opponents used it against him is very, very clear, as you rightly said. He was in the center of a controversy when that was said, because many people still, uh, I mean, have the bad memories of partition and the conflict that we had with the, uh, the people who demanded Pakistan, I mean, in India. So many people took that it's praising of Jinnah, because facts are facts. That's how I would like to see it. I mean, many people in his political camp did not like it very much because they wanted to see it as uh, absolutely an opponent. Because facts are facts, you cannot change it. Uh, sir, we have, we have one more question here. Uh, Sanjit, yeah. you know, I just heard this about uh, Advani. Just want to add on that. Actually, uh, Advani made this statement uh, when he visited uh, Islamabad, I guess, about yeah. Ram, uh, Jinnah as he is a secular. Even after that, he was a prime minister candidate in 2009. But what happened is RSS was completely against him. Uh, I guess none of the RSS people, RSS cadre, uh, campaigned or actually did any work for Advani in 2009 election. That is how, uh, that's why after 2009, uh, when uh, Narendra Modi got in as a prime minister candidate, he was eventually isolated. I, I just wanted to uh, ask them, uh, your opinion on that. I, I think this is a statement, sorry. Uh, but if you think this is right or not. Yeah, in fact, in fact, uh, BJP as a political party, I mean, like any other political party, has its own power conflicts. I mean, that's very well. I mean, if you want to see things objectively, one can see that there are power struggles and there are political conflicts. And there is effort to get hegemony over the party by many people who are capable. You can see that a lot of people got sidelined now. Where is uh, Murali Manohar Joshi? A lot of people who were otherwise very powerful got sidelined when new leadership emerged. But that happens in every political party. So people come and people go in most of the parties. So Adwani lost the grip of the political control when the new leadership emerged. And uh, Narendra Modi, I mean, when he got uh, the support of the whole BJP party, Adwani was, uh, I mean, practically he has gone into oblivion. I mean, that's very, very clear. And... Uh, there are many factors that work against him because the backlash of, uh, for example, the demolition of Babri Masjid was on Adwani, not on other, any other people. It was not on Vajpayee, it was not on Narendra Modi, anybody, but the public narrative was against him. So Adwani was, was uh, unpopular amongst a vast section of people. And, and, but once uh, Narendra Modi came to power, uh, Adwani was nowhere taken closely or he was not proximate to the power centers. So it could be for many other reasons that than, than we can imagine. There could be simple, Adwani did not favor, uh, I mean, Narendra Modi as the prime minister. I mean, it's very clear. I mean, his camp was not very happy about this proposal. When the BJP was promoting a, a prime ministerial candidate in, in Narendra Modi, Adwani publicly made statement that we should not have such a candidate. Perhaps he thought, I mean, he would be the best candidate. So such things also, human conflicts, it works everywhere, I mean, negatively and positively. Actually, yes, sir, we can conclude like this. Tony uh, made the Red Teatra for making uh, Modi as a Prime Minister, right, sir? Um, He's happy, I think. I don't think so. And there is no evidence to lead to that. Because Modi was not a prominent political leader at that time. Adwani wanted to, Adwani was, you know, wanted to make his position to the Prime Ministership uh, after Vajpayee. He wanted to become the topmost boss. And Rathiyatra was, you know, Rathiyatra had two major uh, reasons for that. I mean, for the initiation of Rathiyatra. BJP under Vajpayee was trying to secularize itself, to, to get more support from the secular part of the Janta Party also. So Janta Party was having the socialist former uh, Indian, I mean, Congress O and the Sotandra Party and the all these parties were there. After the split, and when BJP emerged, the entire party was declining. It split into so many different groups. So he wanted to win a support of a major part of these people. And Janata Party was run at that time by Subramani Swami. That was the situation. So Adwani's objective was twofold. Number one, he wanted to come to number one position. And Rathiyatra has actually focused on him. He, he got full support of the whole BJP. And Vajpayee was not part of the Rathiyatra, if, if you remember it. Adwani got the whole public attention on that point. There was another reason for that. Vajpayee's policy has been alienating Vishwa Hindu Parishad, who was advocating for demolition of this temple. Because the, the Ayodhya issue was mainly taken over by Vishwa Hindu Parishad, which was another entity. And Vishwa Hindu Parishad was taking that as a major campaign of them. So to win the Hindu plan, you know, the support of the Hindu watch bank or Hindu political entity, 
they didn't want Vishwa Hindu Parishad as a competitor. So they, Vishwa Hindu Parishad started its own campaign. They started its own money collection worldwide. They started collecting stones for that. It's not with those stones. It's not with those pillars that the temple is now made. That's all lying at a separate place. That's not even used now. Vishwa Hindu Parishad was trying to take this movement to get the Hindu plank with them. And then immediately, Vajpayee took over this, stealing the slogan, was the classical political science word for that, stealing the slogan from Vishwa Hindu Parishad. He became the champion of the Ayutthaya uh, movement. And he became eventually the major mascot of the BJP party. And it emerges as a Hindu political plank with uh, Adwani as the potential leader. That did not work. Immediately after the demolition of a masjid, there was, the government was dismissed. And the next election, BJP could not win even Uttar Pradesh. So what Adwani proved, not as a successful leader, though his dream was to use thus to come to power. That was it. Narendra Modi at that time was in, in Gujarat. His fo focus was on Gujarat and coming to power again in Gujarat. It's much later that he came to national scene. Shall I ask one more question? Please. Uh, now, now I think uh, the RSS have cut the VHP to size. And now VHP uh, now acting as a Parivar organization. And uh, uh, now VHP not daring to uh, grow beyond its size. And its relevance is now uh, under a uh, another level. or a, It is just a Parivar of RSS now. What is your uh, idea? See, these all are competing organizations to get the support of the Hindu support base. There is a huge Hindu support base within India and outside India. There are many organizations competing to get that support base. So it's promoted with a lot of things. For example, starting from Chinmaya, Chinmayananda's Gita mission and all these kinds of things at one side, the Ayodhya movement. This, this was the situation that, I mean, Vishwa Hindu Parishad with its leadership with the Togadi at one side, was very powerfully criticizing BJP at one side and BJP leadership. And he wanted to steal the uh, slogan for them. So now where is Togadia? Togadia was the mascot of Vishwa Hindu Parishad. He was the international general secretary, I think. Now BJP or, or what, whatsoever it is, Togadia is out of power. Vishwa Hindu Parishad is no more in the, in the good books of the Hindu Hindutva movement. And Togadia, when he had a car accident, he even claimed that the government has tried to kill him with an accident. To that extent, he came. So Togadi is the leader of the Vishwa Hindu Parishad movement. Now the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, there is a parallel Vishwa Hindu Parishad uh, made with BJP's effort. It's split into two practically. So Vishwa Hindu Parishad got into size, but uh, BJP tried to grab all support, different sides, the development plank, the Hindu plank, all these kind of things they are trying to get into their political support base. Can I ask a little clarity on this, uh, sir? Uh, 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 yes, yes, please. Okay, so uh, regarding the Adwani uh, thing, right? So is it because uh, Adwani failed in Uttar Pradesh, that's why uh, Vajpayee emerged as a leader, or is it to uh, you know attract the secular parties as allies, for example, TDP, DMK, and all were allies for BJP that time? Oh, is, is that the reason because Vajpayee was like kind of soft face of Hindu, where Adwani was portrayed as uh, more, more, even stronger, right? And um, stronger Hindu line, right? So is that the reason, which one, which one of these is more relevant? Or is yeah, it I, let, me, let me ask, you know, you started with the question, because Adwani failed in Uttar Pradesh, did Adwani contest in Uttar Pradesh? Is that what you mean? He didn't contest in Uttar Pradesh. No, you I, I heard you said that, like, next election. Next now, election, BJP, BJP uh, not Adwani, BJP. It was Kalyan Singh who was the chief minister. It was Kalyan Singh who was the chief minister. His government was dismissed by Narasimha Rao. And there was an election, and BJP lost Uttar Pradesh at that time. So, which means, the despite the demolition, the Hindus in Uttar Pradesh did not vote for BJP in that election. That's what I said. So, it was, in fact... The, the, the Ayodhya demolition did not give immediate research to, in favor of BJP. But it has, you know, Hindutva has a certain, I mean, support base in India. Like, like I mean, anybody, anybody who is in politics, if there is a support base, they would not I mean, want to lose it. And they would not want to give to some other party. So naturally, they would try to maintain the Hindutva support base. And they would, of course, with that alone, they cannot 
come to power. Even now, if you get the whole Hindu votes to BJP, they would come with thumping majority. Even not even half of the Hindus are voting for BJP, even in this, the governments where they are successfully in power. So they are in alliance with wherever it's possible, wherever it is necessary. They try to make alliance with other political parties. They try to make alliance with the BSP. They try to make alliance with any other political party which is, they, which is uh, I mean, agreeing to cooperate with them. They made alliance with uh, Ramila's Paswan. So it's all, I mean, they try, they, are, they don't have a kind of a, an un untouchability to anybody. Their only goal was to come to power and they were willing to make alliance with anybody to the, I mean, with the goal that they want to come to power. And eventually, like any other political party, they would like to get their own support base. And one of the major support bases that BJP has is the Hindutva vote, which was earlier with Congress party, which they don't want to lose now to the Congress party. So when Congress party also uses the Hindutva card, they will use it more powerfully. When Congress party, if Congress party uses more secular slogan, they would tone down this. But if Congress party uses the same Hindutva plank, they would become more aggressive not to lose the Hindutva support base to Congress. That's a classical case. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, Sajid. Daddy, please. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. Uh, Sanal, sir, I wanted to ask you one uh, question. Uh, this Hindutva uh, of Modi and Hindutva uh, when Vajpayee was there, it's, I see there's a lot of difference, right? Like, not as hard as, like, it's more like pro corporate, free market, more like right leaning. Uh, it's not, maybe ex with the exception of UP, Yogi, and the Nath, uh, mostly uh, Modi cabinet is more like, they are more into business oriented, not too much giving much importance to, you know, in the, the, that is, I could be wrong, but correct me if I am wrong. Second thing is like, uh, you see, like most of the, Left, left liberal in India is focused too much on Hindutva, but in, when it comes to Kerala, we are for, forgetting the fact that there are party under Muslim League, SPP, IPD, which are a lot of uh, Islamic influence and uh, mm -hmm. play vote bank politics. Just ignore that and we are only really focusing on Hindutva, especially this uh, radicalization of uh, in Kerala and, and certain Muslim communities also factor. Uh, that, uh, what is the reason behind that? Yeah, primarily the left narrative uh, in Kerala about the national situation is not generally accepted by the national political parties. That's a, that's the, that's a local narrative of the left parties because uh, that's an easy way to handle it because the major opposition is the Congress party. There are only some binary situation and uh, Congress, they are in alliance in many states and they don't want to fight Congress. So they want to fight something. So a comparatively uh, less powerful political entity is BJP. So they want to demonize BJP, which is not an entity in Kerala, which has less than five or six or maximum 10% votes only, and which, which has no seats in Kerala assembly, but they speak only about BJP in Kerala, because that's easy. Because if they speak about Congress party, I mean, just after the border of Kerala in Tamil Nadu, they are in alliance with Congress party. In most of the part of India, they are in alliance with Congress party, and they don't have any existence without the support of Congress party or alliance of other par with other parties. So it's a small political entity uh, which needs a narrative without touching Congress party. So that is why uh, one of the reasons that they are mainly focusing on a non-entity in Kerala politics that they major political uh, opponent, number one. Number two, you spoke about who supports the, the, the capital in India or corporates in India. Which political party in India does not support the capital? Indian political system is based on capital. If you speak about the economic system, whether it was an alliance with the left parties in government or with the socialist parties or with the International Congress or BJP, all are following one policy and the same policy that is based on investment and capital and production accordingly. They, I mean, what is a, a, a position that's against the capital? Nationalization of the production uh, of the country. That is the socialist pattern against the capital. All other things are capital. Capital in the private sector or in the corporate sector. And who would, which political party in India is against the corporate sector? Which state in India is against the corporate sector? Without the support of the corporate sector, how would they run the country? Do they want to go the old Soviet model to nationalize every means of production and bring under the state and uh, try to I mean try to do it again the Cuban way or the Russian way? I mean, that's I, I don't think I mean they don't they don't even speak about that. But the lower level cadre of this party, 
who were you know trained earlier with this kind of ideas especially with the influence of the maoists on the other side and the, the lower level cadre which has more leaning to the maoists would normally speak about the left liberal and i mean the capital and all these kind of things the to my understanding even the state government of kerala is trying to bring in investment in the state and who would invest the corporations would invest and who else would invest do they think of nationalizing things and make all production under the state control no but some people who are trained in the the school of this ideology who has more leaning towards the radical left which are not in the political plank and they get confused and they would speak about oh it's all capital and this is all capital we are against capital but the cpm for example in kerala is not speaking about capital they are speaking about bjp the jains monster which they want to demonize which is not existing as a political entity in kerala because they don't want to speak about capital because they want investment in kerala from the so called corporations or the the people who would invest if any government wants investment from abroad if any government want investment from the people who produce they are seeking investment from the corporate sector and when you seek investment from the corporate sector how dare you would speak about the capital you are against the capital what kind of system they want in in uh, the country i mean conventionally one can speak about that but that has no meaning these are rhetoric meaningless gibberish which would be satisfying and you know a kind of unrest lower level activists who are still in the magical world of uh, what you call the means of production going to the the state and i mean uh, everything going under the classical marxian explanation things have moved some people still don't understand they are still living in the past that's a whole problem thank you thank you very much thank you sanil sir yeah so it's a uh, wonderful talking to you. i mean listening to you most of the time i came here quite late and uh, i couldn't listen to the major part of your lecture about ali bazant what i want to ask you is that uh, yesterday there was a there was a room hosted by arabi kunnat and in that topic the subject matter of discussion was your statement that the bjp is not the brain child of the rss and uh, there were a lot of discussions regarding this one and uh, i am at pains to understand why you made you made such a statement uh, before that i didn't hear directly from your mouth i heard it from the panel of of uh, our speakers over there yeah that's not a but subject me, here but i would can still mention about that if that's a question but can i can i yeah, can i finish my question yeah please Complete. yeah to my very limited knowledge of indian politics and the sang politics the bjp is in fact the brain child of the rss because the bjp currently the current government is implementing the the policies the ideology which has been laid by the forefathers the founding fathers of the rss mostly ms golwalker because golwalker himself has said that foreign races referring to muslims and can, can you make it short please make it short yeah, because yeah. we are in the fag and of the meeting just 30 seconds 30 seconds he said in his book that uh, the foreign races should be totally subversive and subservient to the hindu nation claiming no rights not even citizens rights so this citizen amendment bill has been brought up by bjp and in every aspect the ideology of rss has been followed by the bjp can you throw more light on this now i wanted to interfere in the beginning because you are speaking on something that you do not know number one so first of all mr kunath this guy i mean he is an activist of a political party cpm i think and he thinks that he is a he is an ideologue of the party but he makes at home in always where did i say that the bjp and uh, rss has no connection my statement was long back uh, on a on a speech on uniform civil code somebody uh, again a low, low level activist somewhere i mean he asked a question he asked if if uh, uniform civil code is brought by bjp how can we uh, if brought by rss how can we trust it that was the question at that time that was some 3 4 months back kunath is still clinging on that and biting on that and he's running around that so my statement in reply to that was it's still on the internet uh, very simple bjp is a party registered with the election commission of india with its own constitution rss is a different organization which was founded in 1920s they are not contesting any election how dare you say that rss is bringing uniform civil code uniform civil code was an idea that was brought first by 
Jawaharlal Nehru and Ambedkar. It is opposed by Rajendra Prasad and uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Later only, the Marxist party, especially the CPM, a section of them, tried to sell this idea to the radical Muslims to tell them that a danger is looming upon their head because this is a, a strategy against them. Their own leader, Yemas Nambudri Pat, was an advocate of uniform civil court. This is what I said. So I said that there are two different entities. This was my statement. Now, Kunath wants to make this as an issue because he wants me to think the way he thinks. And what he thinks, he thinks that uh, India's solution is his party. He thinks that uh, everybody should consider exactly the way he thinks. And I refuse to accept his positions because I'm not a political activist. I'm a political analyst. I studied political science. I understand politics. I understand the mechanics of politics. I understand the fine divisions in politics. But if people are in a political camp, they have to buy the ideology or slogans or the narrative sold to them, which they want to swallow the way it is presented to them. Unfortunately, I don't belong to that camp. So I have my own understanding and he should not dare to force me to think the way he thinks. Because unfortunately, I don't belong to his school of thought. I try to understand things in a different way. Of course, I mean, these are two different entities. Both try to influence each other. RSS has certainly a strong influence on BJP. It has helped in its foundation. But my statement, what they try to answer is a statement which I never said. Or it's, it's they try to mold it the way they want that I should say. And they make a, you know, a straw man and build the straw man and attack it because they have only one narrative. They cannot speak about any other narrative in the Kerala politics. They want to speak about a non-entity in Kerala politics, that is BJP. And everybody should buy their ideology. Mr. Kunnath is running around something that is not existing. The statement that he speaks is a misinterpretation or misrepresentation of me. And you are asking me, I mean, on the basis of the misrepresentation that Mr. Kunnath has made. So therefore, there is no point in answering that. thing. I think that he is living in a fool's paradise. There is a section in Kerala's uh, Marxist radical groups. There are so many different uh, radical groups under the Marxist frame in Kerala. Some of them, for example, one there was one, some, some Stalinists are there, some Maoists are there. I mean, all, all these kind of people want to put me on a plank on their political understanding. They want me to speak what they think. Unfortunately, the problem is I'm not a politician, nor intend to enter into politics. I'm a political analyst. And I speak what I understand. They can take it, they can reject it, number one. But they cannot imagine that I should follow their way of thinking, in, in their way of understanding, in their way of, you know, the, the way they understood things. It's unfortunate that, uh, you know, in, in Kerala, the whole scene is the three groups that are fanatically against rationalists. That's also to be known to the world and nation that um, the two, three, two, three groups are fanatically against the rationalist movement. The number one group is the CPM and its radical outfits. Second comes the Pentecostal radicals. Third comes the Muslim radicals. This is the order of the fanaticism against rationalism. They're fanatically against rationalists. They think that we are on a bourgeois humanist path they have a lot of complaints about us because we are against dogmas. So the fan fanatically, they oppose rationalist movements more fanatically than any religious extremist groups. Therefore, we decided to respond to it, not at their level, not in their language, but with facts. And we are not politicians, but we understand politics and we speak politics and people understand it. Thank you, sir. sir. I know the reason behind why this communist, I think, uh, very wrong about this uh, Rational thinkers, because in their unconscious mind, they know their idea is a religious idea. I think so. What about you, sir? Yeah, there. Are, I don't. See, there, there is a religious element, a dogmatic element in any kind of ideology. The moment it's an ideology which cannot be changed. There is an arbitrary assumption of authority for them. The, 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 they have a holy book, the Communist Manifesto, and there is a holy ideology, the dialectical materialism, which cannot be questioned. They think that. Like the Muslim would say that everything in the universe is explained in the Quran. They would say that everything is explained in dialectical materialism. Look at the universe, look at the global order, look at the whole political scene, look at uh, the, the natural sciences, look at physics, look at chemistry, everything ever, computer science, artificial intelligence, everything is dialectical materialism. Because our masters in 1800 said about it, they knew everything, quote, quote, and everything is correct. This is exactly what the Muslim fanatics would say, but they are less fanatic 
than the Marxist fanatics in Kerala. True, sir. Very true. Very true. Yes, absolutely. I think what you said uh, was absolutely. I would agree upon that. And on this note, we would meet next weekend and with the more interesting and more socially relevant topics. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you, sir, and everybody who has joined this meeting. Thank you, Shubhi. Thank you, everybody in the moderating panel. Uh, Baba, Helen, uh, Dan, Mathu, mainly taking the initiative. Thank you, everybody, and we see you next week again.